Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ken Akiha, and I'm a curriculum development manager here at code.org. Uh, as a curriculum development manager, that means I get to make lessons, make activities, uh, make lesson plans, lesson plans, and uh, gather feedback about how all of those things are working in classrooms from teachers and students like yourself who are tuning in today. Um, really excited to, to uh, join you all today, and thanks to all the classrooms who are tuning in uh, for today's My Journey class chat. Teachers, we've enabled live closed captioning for all of our class chats. Today, we are excited and lucky to welcome Bertrand St. Pru, a, a product manager at Snap, who started and leads Snap's inclusive camera team to ensure Snap's camera works well for everyone, regardless of their skin tone, cultural background, beauty standards, or ability. Teachers, please let us know where you're tuning in from and put your students' questions for Bertrand in the Q&A, and we'll try our best to get to some of those during the chat today. Uh, Bertrand, we'll start with a uh, fun icebreaker. Uh, so it's just a little, would you rather? Would you rather be able to breathe underwater or be able to fly? And I'll go first. Uh, I think I'm gonna say flying. I just, I think the, the idea of moving quickly through the air is a cool sensation and uh, the, the views that you could get from uh, being able to fly are definitely uh, something that I would treasure. So how about yourself? I definitely say flying as well. Um, just, it would make traveling so much easier. There's so many places I'd be able to go um, and I wouldn't need a car. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Where's someone, where's somewhere you would wanna fly where you would wanna travel if you had that ability? Japan, easily Japan. Oh, very cool. Very yeah. cool. My, 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 my father's side of the family is from Japan. So I've lived there for a year. So that's, that's awesome. Cool. Very cool. Well, uh, well, welcome Bertrand again. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we'd love to just start with a little uh, introduction from yourself. And if you could tell us a little bit about your work and what you do at SNAP. Yeah. Um, so again, my name is Bertrand saint Pois or Bertrand saint Pru. Um, I'm a product manager at Snapchat. Um, and I work um, to build products to make the camera more inclusive, no matter who you are, um, your skin tone, your race, culture, beauty standards, or just whoever you are, essentially making the camera work for you. Uh, and so that is a really, really fun and impactful project that I'm really happy to say I work on. Um, and yeah, oh, and I'm also from Miami, Florida. And if you can tell from my name or not, um, I'm very Haitian, which is a uh, country in the Caribbean. Um, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, um, yeah, you, you mentioned this inclusive camera. I wonder if you could just tell us what, what is it and, and just maybe give us a little bit more background about, about it. Yeah. So the inclusive camera is essentially um, a way in which uh, Snap is working to recreate the camera um, to work better for folk. The camera has unfortunately not worked um, inclusively of everyone uh, in its history. It started off um, working for, for lighter skin tones because the Shirley card and various other, uh, the Shirley card, which is a color correction card um, that folks used to use to go into um, Photo Hut. This is way back in like the 1940s and 50s, well into our parents and parents, uh, grandparents. Um, when they used to go develop their photos, it was all developed against a photo um, of a woman who was white uh, and it had the, the caption normal on it. And so if you were never a person who uh, who identified as a lighter skinned person um, and you went to get your photos developed, then they just wouldn't be looking as good as they could be. And so that history went on into the digital age. And yeah, and that's what caused us at Snap to be able to want to create an inclusive camera, which recreates and rewrites the way that cameras are made um, from the process and software level uh, to better be able to take a picture of everyone, no matter who you are. And so there's a little bit of a, a video that I have to explain this a bit more. Cool. Um, well, uh, well, Bertrand gets that video ready. I just wanted to welcome folks joining from Dover, Delaware, Pittsburgh, Sacramento, North Dakota. So good to have people from all over the country joining today. I think people of color assume that their skin tones are difficult to photograph because they've seen themselves in lights that are not complementary to how they look. 
and that's absolutely not the case. When you look at the camera technology, when you look at the history of it, when you look at how image making has evolved throughout the years, there are some actual technological <laughs> limitations when it comes to how we show up on screen. My name is Bertrand Saint-Poix, and I am the lead for the Inclusive Camera. I've experienced situations where like, my skin has been lightened by the camera. Taking photos of myself and just like, it doesn't work, especially in low light settings, you don't see me. So I really want to improve that experience for myself and for the community. My mom picking up a phone is assuming that this phone has the best interests for her skin tone and who she is and the photos she wants to take. Um, but there's that assumption there that it should be figured out already, but it, it really isn't. A lot of times camera companies are registering our skin colors as shadows instead of as skin. So it just kind of becomes muddy. The inclusive camera is just a camera that allows any person to be seen by the camera the way that they want to be seen, the way that they are. I love having a balance of like, this was made with everybody in mind, because that opens up a whole other path of like what creativity could look like when it's actually being made with good purpose. You see that saturation that comes in, it lifts it a lot. It feels like there's a filter on it. We want every time that you open the Snapchat camera to be a moment that you feel as though you can express yourself any way that you want to. It's not gonna be an easy journey and rebuilding our camera is just the first phase. Improving low light, flash capture, and exposure correction so that we can account for all people's skin tones and their undertones. So that any person, whatever phone they're picking up, they're able to take a good selfie. And this is just the beginning. Awesome, Bertrand. Thanks for sharing that video. Um, you mentioned your, your title being like a product manager, and I feel like that that video showed some of some of your you at work a little bit. And so I wonder if you could kind of talk about your role in this project. I mean, it said you're the lead, but what is what is like the day to day? What has that process been like of of guiding that project? Yeah. So um, being a product manager. Uh, pretty much means that like you define the vision of the product and from end to end from the con concept of the product all the way to like it being released and even then after you're working with engineers designers and everyone in between to make sure that the product needs to be exactly what it needs to be for the community and especially in this case for the inclusive camera we're like redefining the whole like typical product um, development process and so I work with a ton of photographers um, some of which some of which you saw uh, I work with like marketing and comms and just various folk to understand and tell like, how do we tell this story to the community um, and help them understand the product. So it's uh, a lot of hats that you get to wear as a product manager. You're pretty much like the middle person of everything to make sure that the product is what it needs to be. Yeah, I wonder, that's so cool. You get to interact with so many different people and like and super collaborative. Um, I think that's something that uh, you know, students and teachers watching probably hopefully resonate with kind of that collaborative nature of computer science and building something together um, kind of can make it a fun subject. I wonder, you know, you mentioned the photographers just because we saw them in the video. Could you talk a little bit about the, the, the contribution um, that they, you know, how did that back and forth go and, and what was their contribution to the, the vision, like you said? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I when I started this project and pitched it to the to the uh, to the team, um, one thing that we realized was just that like, even though we're a camera company and we have a camera team, I was on the camera team even before um, joining this project. That there aren't any photographers on the camera team, and so like, what does it look like to actually bring those folk in and have them tune our algorithms for us? So we created tools for them to be able to like. Um, computational photography tools, which is pretty much photography and technology. And like, how do you build photography into code, um, which is what computational photography is. And so we built a bunch of those algorithms and uh, or uh, an, a few of those algorithms. And we, we had them go through and tune it in similar to like Photoshop. Like, what does it look like for these algorithms to work on different people? So we translated what we do is we work with them and they told us like what they would do with the normal DSLR camera, like the Nikon cameras or Kodak cameras. Um, and we converted that into code uh, so that the, our algorithms can work really well. Very cool. Um, I also know that 
you know, in the video I mentioned like some features of like, like flash correction and things like that. Like, I wonder if you could talk more about some of the specific things that, that have come out of this project, yeah. Absolutely, and I'm happy to be able to show some as well. Uh, so pretty much one of the things that was just that was mentioned in that video was that we um, work with these photographers, not just on our algorithms, but just to understand like flash capture and how to light people uh, in lower light. And so one of the features that we released are, is ring flash. So in uh, when folks are usually taking a flash, uh, if you use Snapchat um, and you're on the front facing camera and you go and take uh, use flash and like it's really dark outside or dark inside or outside and like flashes on your face and you look at yourself like, oh my goodness, I did not realize that's what I look like. Um, and it happens to me all the time, or it used to happen to me all the time um, until uh, we built Ring Flash, which as I'm trying to share my screen, give me a moment. Um, oh, we built Ring Flash, which uh, essentially illuminates the border around your screen um, so that you can better take uh, snaps at night. And so, while Bertrand just gets that up, uh, just teachers out there and, and students, feel free to keep submitting uh, questions in the Q&A and uh, we'll try our best to get to those uh, later in the conversation, but happy to uh, submit those. So. So usually when you're taking flash and actually I'm gonna make it darker in here so that y'all can truly see. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so when it is darker in here and you take the flash, I did not really know what I looked like. And oh, this is, uh, I was, tell you what that is a little bit later. Um, but what Ring Flash does, it illuminates the border around your screen so that you can better see yourself while you're taking the snap. And so when it's really dark, it works much better, of course. And then what makes it inclusive is that we understand that every person, no matter what skin tone they have, they have different undertones. So no matter your skin tone, most folk are, uh, have either cool, warm, or neutral undertones. So pretty much a white, a warmish red, or a coolish blue undertone. And so we work with our photographers to find which colors are the best to include in the app. And this is a, uh, a more beta version of the app, especially I'm on iOS. Um, and so these colors are definitely still being finalized. Um, but the feature is out for the most part on Android. Very cool. Um, Bertrand, one question we have from uh, John Kreiner in Dover, Delaware is how, and it sounds like the project is still ongoing, but how long have you been working on it? And maybe how long do you see it going, going, going for? Yeah, so we've been working on this project for almost two years now, um, or a year and a half, about a year and a half to two years. It's been it's been a long uh, <laughs> a long blurry journey since 2020. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, and I foresee it. So the camera is not going to be inclusive overnight. Um, these are just the first features that we're working on, and there are many, many, many more to come. It's going to be a long, uh, longer journey of like honestly, I feel as though we can be working on this for easily five years and still have more runway to go. Um, because there's, it's a process. Um, we're learning how to make that process more and more inclusive and build tools to be inclusive because just the field and area of product inclusion, making inclusive product as a whole is very uh, un, uncharted territory for many companies and many people. And so with inclusive camera, we're one of the first who are going in and diving deep into building inclusive products. and making sure that throughout the whole process, there is a diverse group of people that are giving feedback and just uh, throughout the whole process and working with the people who are experts and understand these spaces who aren't necessarily always in the tech companies. Yeah, that's, uh, it's super cool to hear about that work that you all are doing there. And um, 
I think, yeah, some students and, and teachers who are listening might, might kind of resonate with some of that, that feedback process of building a feature, getting feedback, iterating on it, working on one feature at a time. And also this idea of kind of the empathy for the user and, and also thinking about who are the users, right, in an inclusive way, um, something that, you know, students who might be in CS discoveries, CS principles, thinking about as they design their work and do their projects in their classrooms. Um, speaking of, you know, things you might have learned along the way, Bertrand, I'm curious, what are some specific CS skills that you've learned that have helped you build the foundation for what you do uh, with your work today? Yeah, um, honestly, my CS skills uh, very much brought me to where I am today. Uh, so I, before I was a product manager, I was a software engineer on the camera team at Snap and studied computer science in college. Uh, so I have a degree from uh, Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston um, in computer science. And throughout that whole process, uh, what helped me is just understanding um, the fundamentals of technology in general, understanding how uh, the camera works. So I was helping build the foundations and the infrastructure for the camera on our team. And I, through that, am really able to speak to our, uh, our engineering team <laughs> as an engineer, which they fully, fully love uh, because not all product managers have that much of an engineering background. And so right now when there's, when we're working on our computational photography algorithms and going deeper into like how the, they work and even speaking about like whether we should or shouldn't use uh, machine learning, I'm able to uh, speak really deeply with them and understand what they're talking about and vice versa. Um, and so like my computer science background was great because like even on our, on our product, we are focusing on launching on Android first. And as an Android developer beforehand, I was able to understand like why it's so important to be launching on Android um, because the disparities and how many people are using Android around the world compared to iOS. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's cool to hear about that part of your journey. And um, Bertrand, just going back to the what you showed us, kind of the demo, um, there's a question about, can you explain a little bit more about this idea of undertones? Yeah. Um, so at everyone's base level, they have their skin tone. That's what everybody sees. Um, but every person has like different undertones in the sense of like, what, when you're taking pictures or wearing clothes, what colors do you gravitate more towards or which ones do you realize that look better on you? Like if there's a backdrop or you're wearing like a blue shirt, which one do you, which one looks better? Um, and so like under your, uh, under your skin, essentially through your veins, you can tell like what your undertones are. I believe if your veins are like more bluish, you have a cooler undertone. If they're like uh, more greenish, you might have a warmer undertone. There's honestly a website that helps you understand all your undertones. I do not want to butcher it there. Um, I believe I have cool undertones. Um, and so uh, like I look better with the blues. Um, and so it, this ranges. So like within um, black folk, it ranges. It's not like um, black folk or darker skin folk all have blue undertones and lighter skin folk all have warm undertones. Within each skin tone, you can be either. Um, and so yeah, actually, East African folk are more likely to have warm undertones, and West African folk are more likely to have blue undertones. And even though they're still both African and of sure. similar tone ranges. Oh, cool! Thanks for sharing about that. And, and that made me think about something. I think you, a quote for you in the video of this, of like the the image of or the vision of you know being able to be seen the way you want to be, the way you are, the way you want to be seen. And so that makes me think about that. Um, there's a question from from the audience about how will you, the project account for the situation where there's several people in an image and they have different skin tones and, maybe, and different undertones, how, how is it gonna account for all of that? Absolutely, and so that's one of the things where I say that this is going to be a long journey. <laughs> so right now, um, we aren't accounting for that as much or um, in the sense of just like, we are focusing on the selfie camera because 90% of the time it's a single person in the photo. And so trying to get that uh, working really well and then expanding that to multiple people because I want to be able to take the photos with my friends and my family at the same time, the same way I know um, everyone uh, else on this call would want to as well. Um, so that will be uh, definitely to come. Cool, cool. Well, um, you know, Bertrand, 
you know, part of your part of who you are is, is your work, but we'd also love to know a little bit more about you outside of work. So what do you enjoy doing outside of work? Um, a few things. So uh, historically, I used to wrestle, um, was, uh, but more recently, I've been doing a lot of playing music, singing, and roller skating. Um, so joined a lot of the roller skating craze that's happened in the past year, two years. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, is this like roller skating for with like tricks or for speed or, or for like an exercise? Like what is it? What, what kind? Started as exercise because I'm really I when I, I used to get a lot of my exercise from wrestling, stopped doing that um, and don't like running. So started with exercise um, just for distance. But then I started uh, dance skating, jam skating. Um, and have been doing that ever since, which that's pretty much all I do, which is even more of an, at least for me, more of an exercise yeah. than just roller skating on the beach. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've seen, I've seen people in groups doing it. It looks very intense. That's awesome. Um, cool. Um, well, Bertrand, I wonder if we can kind of, um, I don't know, maybe it's tied to your interests, maybe, maybe not, but, you know, kind of even go back to, um, like, yeah, how did you how did you decide to get into this line of work? Kind of where where did where did this interest in computer science um, uh, come from? Yeah, um, so I've always been involved in some level of technology um, from when I was younger. Uh, my brothers and I got into it from trying to uh, figure out how to pretty much uh, get video games um, in a sense through the internet and whatnot. Um, and so that was, that helped me like figure out some level of it. And actually it was my, me watching my brothers do it. Uh, and then from there I played, actually I'm a huge Legend, Legend of Zelda fan and played a ton of video games. Um, but once I got into middle school, I like had like a small, uh, a small instance with it. There was like a, a test for a bunch of subjects and randomly I chose computers just because I was like, oh, I like computers. Um, and I did pretty well in it, but it wasn't until my last semester of high school that I uh, took a computer science class with a Haitian professor um, where I went to school in Florida. And it was completely on a whim. Um, I had a class with him my freshman year. He was the best professor at the school. And um, I promised him before I left, I would take another class with him. I had no idea what class that was, like literally had no idea. And it turned out to be a computer science class. That was the first <laughs> ever actually coded. Um, so wow. like before that, I was actually planning on studying law. Um, and then I took that class and I switched my, like what <laughs> my plan was completely. Um, and then from there, um, I got into some programs that helped black and Hispanic folk, um, college students into tech, Code 2040. Uh, and they were the ones who showed me that like, there is a full intersection between our communities, the black, uh, the black and Hispanic community into, into tech. And like, you can build your, your, keep your, uh, your values into what you build. And so since then, my values have always been to build dope stuff for dope people. And with that increasing folks quality of life through technology. And so um, inclusive camera is one aspect of that. And I can't wait until the future things that I build that are uh, definitely going to be in that realm as well. Very cool. I love that saying. Um, another question from the audience kind of related to what you were just saying is, what, what maybe job internship opportunities did you take of advantage or even kind of projects did you work on um, earlier to gain experience to then get to your current role? Yeah, um, I say this a ton to people uh, because programming is amazing, it's fun, but sometimes it can be really boring. Like it can be, especially when you're sitting and you're trying to figure out just some homework or something that like was uh, just something and like it does, it's not working and you wanna have something to drive you to actually be doing it. Um, and that's kind of what like pushed me, the projects that I built. So I figured out that, or I wanted to build a music app because I did not want to be in charge of the aux cord um, with my friends. And like, I just, it was a whole, I was always in charge of the Oxford and I was just like, let me, let me, let me go to, let me sit back and relax and somebody else play the music for once. Um, and so <laughs> I thought of like, what does it look like to create an app where everybody is in charge of the Oxford? Um, and I was building this throughout college and that's how I really, really learned how to program. 
because I was building something that I really wanted, like something that I was passionate about. Um, and so through that, even though I tried, failed, tried, failed, and tried again, um, I was able to learn so much from that project. And eventually it was able to, to uh, work. Um, Spotify then came out with a similar feature, so I no longer need this project, so that's okay. Um, but uh, it was able to work and uh, got some, used it as like my senior project, even though like I had started as like a, my freshman year as a passion project and eventually got some time even at school to work on it as part of my course too. Um, and it really helped me shape what it looks like to, uh, to code actually and like the practical, um, the practicalities of programming, but also what it looks like to build a product. Um, I think that's some of my first product management experience as well in terms of like defining what the MVP is, the most viable product essentially like the base features you need to get this um, uh, to get this out and go from there, building those, getting feedback from people, showing it to people and doing the whole process. Yeah, that example is uh, super powerful. And I think hopefully, you know, students, teachers who are listening, you know, thinking about maybe like, well, should I try to build that thing that I want to, even if, you know, maybe you don't know how, but it sounds like probably when you started out, you didn't know how you said, you know, you failed a lot of times and, kept at it but like kind of having that vision in mind and um that product management piece that you mentioned there is probably helpful to have your friends give you feedback on you know whether it was working and obviously yourself were you able to relax uh, and and not be in charge of the ox cord so some good feedback streams there for yourself um Richard, i'm curious if you could Talk to us about what obstacles have you faced along your journey and, and how have you approached them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, um, honestly, one of the major obstacles that I faced, uh, especially in the beginning of my career, was like even going from high school to college. Um, I went to a uh, went to school in Florida. And my parents are really education is everything to Haitian parents, like everything. Um, and but unfortunately, due to circumstance, I was didn't have enough scholarships to go to school without uh, without taking out any loans. And um, definitely was not trying to take out any loans. Uh, my parents weren't my parents weren't in favor of loans, which I understand that. Um, so I went to community college for a year, and that was something that was like. Uh, at least a big step back for me in terms of like not something that I was expecting to do. I was expecting to go to state school like my siblings did, um, like so many of my friends did. Um, all the Florida schools, FSU, you have, if you've ever heard of them, they're like really popular schools that like so many of my friends went to. Um, and But unfortunately, I went to, uh, at, unfortunately at the time, honestly, it's the biggest blessing ever. Um, that's the point of this. Um, but unfortunately at the time, I went to a, a community college um, but I didn't let that like stop my career. And so like I was able to um, just keep at it, be persistent and uh, finish my like associates. I had some uh, some college credits from doing dual enrollment um, and finish my associates in a year. And it caused me to really be more tenacious and drive what like I really want and understand that like if I really want to be successful as a software engineer in computer science, I need to like push and then eventually actually after I finished my my associates I transferred to a school in Boston um, ended up taking loans, but it was definitely half the amount that I would have taken if if I stayed for four years and it's honestly the biggest blessing. Um, because that's where I met code 2040 and a ton of other folk. That's very cool to hear and uh, appreciate you sharing about that, your, your journey. It's not always the, uh, the linear path that we might have in mind when we're, when we're younger, but it's obviously where you're at now is doing some super uh, impactful and, and work and work that you're passionate about. So um, super cool to hear about that. And um, yeah, but that's kind of the time that we have for today. So for return, I want to just say thanks a lot for joining us, uh, for sharing everything that you did. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to hear from you and I hope everyone else out there listening uh, also did. Um, thank you to all the teachers and the students who tuned in to listen. Um, just a reminder to the audience, remember you can tune into the one more uh, class chat we have later this spring. And you can also look at, back at the past chats um, if you go to code.org slash csjourneys. And teachers, uh, please check your email for a survey as we really appreciate the feedback 
about these calls um, as we think about future ones. So again, thank you, Bertrand. Thanks everyone listening um, and have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, y'all.